I'm actually more useful than Bill Gates or Donald Trump or Warren Buffett. One of the reasons ancient Jewish wisdom compares poverty to death, strictly from the point of view of generating revenue, being a giver is really good. Our ambition should be limitless. Our greed should be zero. If you are obsessively preoccupied with taking care of other people's needs, why would it surprise you that a good and loving God would reward you with the incredible blessing of financial abundance? Uh, Matt, I'm sorry to have to tell you Please that uh, about 50 or 60 percent, maybe a bit more, of self-described uh, American Jews um, know as much about Judaism as they know about neurosurgery. It's nothing other than the fact that uh, embedded in the ancient Jewish wisdom of the Hebrew text of uh, Old Testament scripture are several hundred tips, tools, and techniques on making money. One of the legitimate questions I think that anybody could have is, hey, Matt, what are you doing interviewing a Jewish rabbi? Like, what on earth has he got to say? What can he possibly add to what we need to know? to build up our revenue, to be able to retire early, to be able to do all the things that we want to do. And uh, my answer is, well, I'm actually more useful than Bill Gates or Donald Trump or Warren Buffett. Boom. Because um, Bill Gates, you know, Bill Gates is really useful in terms of advice, provided you grew up on the cusp of the computer revolution, dropped out of Harvard, had a dad who's an international lawyer and a mom who was on the board of directors of IBM. Under those conditions, Bill Gates has a lot to teach. Correct. Uh, you know, Warren Buffett, yeah, if you got an IQ of about 200 and you started Berkshire Hathaway at the right point and you learned uh, from Graham how to be a value investor, yeah, Warren Buffett has something to tell you. And, you know, Donald Trump, uh, I'm not saying it's, uh, it's easy to make a huge fortune from a small fortune. Most people lose small fortunes and end up with nothing. But the fact is that his dad, Fred Trump, did leave him thousands of apartment units in Queens and Manhattan. Mm -hmm. and he parlayed that in. But still, if, if you're just an ordinary person whose father didn't leave you 16,000 apartment units, uh, then he's not very much used to you. I mean, entertaining, no question about it. Sure, sure. Uh, but, uh, but no, uh, I am more useful for the following reason. And that is that uh, for... Um, a very long period of time, more than hundreds of years, Jews have been disproportionately good with money. Correct. Now, this is not an anti-Semitic statement. It's not bigotry. It's just simple reality. And if it makes many of my fellow Jews uncomfortable when I say it, which it does, uh, suck it up, boys. I mean, that's all there is to it. So uh, it, it's a reality. And um, this is true in, in good and hospitable countries like the United States of America. And it's also been true in uh, tyrannical regimes that Jews mm -hmm. have lived in. And it's true today as it was true 300 years ago and 500 years ago today. And it's, it's been true not for one or two or three high IQ individuals or uh, people who inherit it. No, it's been true for a huge number of Jews uh, of, of every background and every shape and every gender and every color. Uh, Jews come in a variety and, and without exception. Now, it's not to say there are no poor Jews. Of course they are, but disproportionately. The number of Jews, the percentage of people of my faith uh, who do exceptionally well in business is stunning. It's, it's incontrovertible and it's quite shocking. And so um, the question is, um, you know, how is this achieved? What makes this work? Is it circumcision? <laughs> you know, then a whole lot of guys would probably prefer poverty. <laughs> or, or try to do it three or four times. <laughs> So, um, so happily, after, after much research and, and a great deal of uh, time invested in the studies, biblical studies that I do, I was able to, to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt, uh, you know, that it's, it's not intelligence. The truth is super high intelligence is a drawback. You know, when people say he's too smart uh... and good, that's what they mean. The fact is Sam Walton, who started Walmart, 
typical, you know, just an ordinary guy. Super high IQ people end up on the faculties of universities. And I don't know if you've got any clients who are academics, Matt, but I do. And, and nobody is worse at managing money than academics. Really? No. Wow. So, Check that um, uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's not IQ. It's not, uh, circumcision. It's not chicken soup. Uh, it's nothing other than the fact that, uh, embedded in the ancient Jewish wisdom of the Hebrew text of, uh, old Testament scripture are several hundred tips, tools, and techniques on making money. So now, now, now the, the, Jew, the Jewish people, lots of times people think that the Jewish people, well, they own a lot of property, they own a lot of businesses. And, you know, you've mentioned in our past interview that they're disproportionately the wealthiest uh, the religious group in America. Um, but the Jewish people came to the United States of America absolutely flat, broke, and penniless. And so, they came at a time where nobody was teaching English as a second language, and nobody was allowing you to take care of your civic duties, like take your driver's license in your old language. In those days when they came here, it was English or nothing, pal. <laughs> it's it. And there was also, there was no social security. There was no welfare. There was no benefits. Uh, when they came here, nobody was handing them out money. So what were the principles? What were the mindsets? What was the values? What is it about the Jewish faith that causes this massive amount of wealth building with inside your, your, your religious community? Yeah. So uh, most of it is a series of uh, several hundred tips and tools and specific techniques embedded within the Hebrew writings of the Old Testament. We, we touched on one when you and I were chatting before we started yeah. the show. Um, and, and so, um, and I'll, I'll just give you an example of a couple of these. Um, one of them, the one we spoke about, um, showed how in the, uh, in the, one of the one of the pilgrims, one of the, the founding fathers who came to uh, Plymouth in 1621 was William Bradford, who knew Hebrew, and uh, and he called you know he said it's the Lord's language. Well, mm -hmm. uh, in in the Lord's language, uh, we we can see in the five books of Moses that um, the uh, that Judaism regards taking care of your customer or your client or your boss uh, as the Lord's work. So we don't see religion as something we do on Sunday morning at church or Saturday morning at synagogue, uh, but we see it as something we do Monday through Friday mm -hmm. um, all the time, even when we're at our office, we're at our work, whether I'm a plumber or a roofer or a bookkeeper or whatever it is I do, yep. uh, I'm actually taking care of God's other children. Look, uh, we know from athletics, we, know, we also know from... Uh, from um, any form of physical endeavor, the military, for instance, we know people have to be psyched up. We, you've got to believe yeah. in what you're doing. It's yeah. one of the reasons that the defender uh, has an advantage in military encounters, because you feel indignation at the invader, and you feel very justified as a defender. Uh, and so it is, if you feel deep in your heart that making money is taking money away from other people, that every dollar you get paid is something that another person has less of, then you are going to be considerably less effective at what you do. Hmm. But one of the things that scripture teaches us, and again, you won't get this from an English translation of scripture. I'm sorry to say, I wish you could, but you can't. But uh, from the Hebrew, it becomes uh, abundantly clear that that is part of serving the Lord. So you go about your work completely differently. Right. Another right. thing is um, uh, how to connect with other people. I often hear people say to me, you know, I, I, I finished lecturing in which I said uh, that uh, the, your ability to make money is very proportional to the number of people who know you, like you, and trust you. And the person comes up to me after, it happens every time, Matt, somebody comes up to me afterwards and says, hey, Rabbi, what should I do? I'm not, I'm a real introvert. I just, I don't, I don't like meeting, I don't like talking to people. I'm, I'm just an introvert. Mm-hmm. You know, well, yeah. uh, they think that's the end of the conversation. So right. now I have to figure out a way for them how introverts are going to make money. Ain't going to happen, pal. 
And but again, in in the Hebrew scriptures, the message that comes across to the people of Israel is that being an introvert is a lot like having pimples when you're a teenager. There's you a phase, right? It's a phase. It's a phase, and you don't accept it, right? Correct. I I sure didn't walk around when I was 15 saying to folks, "Hey, um, meet me." You know, I'm Daniel Lapp, and I'm just a pimply teenager. I didn't spend. Do I mean, I spent the equivalent of a small country's gross domestic product on pharmaceuticals to clear my face up. <laughs> and so, what I say to uh, to the, the introvert is, so cut it out. Mm -hmm. You 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 know, you're not a you're not a, a cow or a cat or a kangaroo. You're a human being. You don't have to be tomorrow what you were yesterday. Yesterday, you were an introvert. Yeah. Stop it. Sure. Just cut it out. Stop being an introvert. It's an unhealthy, bad state of affairs. It's not normal. It's not natural. End it. It's Stop it. Really? How do I stop being? That's a different question. If, you, if you, you know, you're into this and you want to stop being an introvert, yeah. sure, I, I got exercises. I can take you through that. But but uh, these are the reasons we don't accept these things. Uh, we, we, we understand from the book written by the manufacturer himself what the nature of human beings are. And, and we, we learn that and, uh, and material on how to interact with people, how to develop transactions, mm -hmm. even things on how to become more articulate and how to become a more effective communicator. All of this is part of ancient Jewish wisdom, and wow. the, the people of Israel have exploited it to the full. But one thing I realized about uh, 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 Jewish brothers and sisters is that they in cousins, they, uh, and I say that from a spiritual standpoint, is that they do business with each other. I, I, I'll give you an example. I was having such a hard time, Rabbi uh, Lappin, when I started my business. None of my friends and family wanted to listen to me, do business with me, uh, send me referrals. And then my friend who took me to a, um, it was a Passover. He took me to a Passover, right? And what's that, what's that service? Uh, uh, Seder. Seder, correct. So I came in, I had to wear I had the, the yarmulke and, and talking about the Seder. And I was just listening to the reading and, and, and whatnot. And uh, afterwards, I, and he, he mentioned, fact, I just started a personal fitness company here downtown Chicago. I'm like, oh yeah, watch everybody turn them down. Oh, Really? Have it, give me your cards. Let me pass them around. I'm like, what? Everybody's supporting you in business? So you talk about specialization in your book. What is it about the tribes? Can, can you unpack the tribes of, 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 of Israel, how, how that happened in the areas of specialization that they did? Um, yeah, so it's, it's two things. And that in Genesis chapter, and you'll pardon me, I'm, I'm going to quote the, the actual verse because um, that's where my information comes from. Okay. Sure. This, this, uh, I, my books have transformed the lives of tens of thousands, no, hundreds of thousands of people now. Uh, I, love, I love getting testimonies by email. I get them all the time. I read them, every single one of them. Uh, people who followed the uh, guidance of my two books and my, um, my uh, online programs, and have changed their financial destiny substantially and significantly. Um, it's um, uh, it's not because I'm clever. I didn't give information that I figured out by myself. No, this is all information straight out of scripture. And mm -hmm. so chapter two, verse 18 is where uh, uh, the Lord says, uh, it's not good for man to be alone. Yeah. Now, a lot of people think this is talking specifically about Adam and his matrimonial prospects, but you'll notice that uh, the next verse does not say, oh, and God put uh, Adam to sleep and extracted Eve and presented him and said, hey, you know, Adam, take a look at this uh, hot woman here. <laughs> you know, this is your life now. And no, that's not what happened. Something else happened. Inform something about animals takes place. Because the verse, not good for man to be alone, does not refer exclusively to Adam. It's a general statement for all men in every place and in every time. And that is that if you are lonely, if you are isolated, if you are disconnected from other people, you will go hungry, period. Hmm. And that's why it is that... Um, the uh, the most reliable uh, indicator of financial success 
is, and again, I mean, this, this shows up in many, many books, including The Tipping Point by, um, uh, what's it? I forget. Oh, right, right. I know that book you talk. White, white cover. Um, the tipping, uh, the tipping point. Uh, Mal 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 uh, Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Um, so he points it out, but many people point out it's quite a well-known thing, and that is that your financial success is directly proportional to the number of friends you have, the people who know you, like you, and trust you. Yeah. Now, this is not Facebook friends. Because Facebook friends is zero, means absolutely nothing. You know, I'll happily exchange 5,000 Facebook friends for one customer. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's, it's, it's rubbish. But real friends, people who return your call in 24 hours, um, people you can talk to. Now, the, the truth is most of us don't have as many of, us, of those as we'd like to think. And, uh, you know, if I had to guess on average, most, most people – watching us now, you know, probably don't have more than about 30. It's not, you know, like, oh, I've got hundreds of friends. Uh -uh. It's not actually true. You don't. By the time you actually sit down to figure it out and count them out, which is an exercise everyone should do. So the point is that um, the good Lord wants us to be connected with one another and not isolated from one another. And so uh, one of the things about the LDS church, and it's also true of the Jewish community, is we're kind of well connected to each other. We see each other regularly. We meet up with each other. Uh, we give, uh, um, you know, we, we say, no, I'm sorry. I wish I could help you. I can't, but I'll tell you who can. I'll give you the phone number of two people who are in that area. We do that all the time. And so, um, uh, I, in, in my teachings, whether it's in church on Sunday mornings or in uh, business programs and seminars, it's always to increase, actively increase the number of people who know you, like you, and trust you. And so uh, that's number one. And uh, number two is, and it's connected to it, is directly related to the question as you phrased it, uh, which is the question of specialization. Now, um, uh, here, here is uh, an example of, of how to do it. Look, we all like it. Um, you, you just have one child at the moment? Uh, 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 under two. <laughs> we have, I have five total, 25 years old, 19-year-old twins, a 10-year-old, oh, well, and a two-year-old. Okay, fabulous. Yeah, yeah. fabulous. Okay, great. Uh, so which one's the Lamborghini driver? Uh, oh, yes, that's, that, would be, that would be Jordan, which, of course, Ivan cut that video. So uh, that was his tryout video to get a job. <laughs> the two-year-old. That's the two-year-old right now, correct. Good. Okay, well, it's good he's starting young. <laughs> um, Thank you. So, yeah. um, but in the same way that we like it when we see our children getting on with each other and loving each other, we don't like to see them squabbling with each other. Correct. In the same way, our Father in Heaven also wants to see us connecting with each other and helping with the, helping each other. Amen. So um, when uh, two of our daughters, they wanted to, in, they were homeschooled, but they wanted to try out what a school would be like. So mm -hmm. they went off to, we sent them off to a, a boarding school in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then um, this was, you know, they, they didn't have access to email or anything. It was just regular letters. And my wife, Susan, would write each of them a letter with an alternate word on the separate yeah. sheet of paper. So each girl got a letter, which was gobbledygook. You could make no sense of it unless you'd meet up with your sister at lunchtime or whatever. You both take out your letters and now you, you read them together. And so uh, each girl ultimately wow. reads one word and then the whole letter makes sense. And we did this because we wanted to make sure they spend time together with each other. Okay, so, so that's how that works. The great thing about specialization is it makes us need one another. And, uh, you know, I think back to uh, when Samuel Colt started his uh, uh, revolver manufacturing um, firm in Connecticut in the uh, 1800s. And mm -hmm. what was so interesting here is what happened was he used to have six guys sitting around a big table and uh, against the wall, around the walls of the room, you know, there was a blank stock for barrels, blank stock for, uh, for uh, 
um, uh, uh, for um, uh, trigger assemblies and, and okay. just all, yeah. and then each guy would go and and he'd take a piece of uh, steel and he'd go to the drill press and drill out the barrel and then he'd um, he'd put the um, uh, the uh, he, he'd assemble it. Uh, with um, uh, the, the various other components. And then when it was finished, he'd put his initials on the back of the handle and put it in a basket. And at the end of the day, Samuel Colt would gather up all the revolvers and he'd pay each man according to the number of revolvers that he made. That's right. how it worked. Interesting. Um, but then uh, Samuel Colt discovered the secret of specialization. Partially what happened, he didn't learn it from the Bible. He learned it from Adam Smith who had written a book in 1776 that spoke about specialization. And just look and see, you know, with, with me here for a moment, Matt, what happened to Samuel Colt. He says to the six guys, hey, guys, we're going to have a change around here. You're not going to like it at first, but I think it's going to work out better for everybody. He says, uh, you, Adam, you're going to make just barrels. And uh, um, Brad, you're just going to make cartridges and uh, the, uh, the, um, the revolver. And Charlie, you're going to make the handle. And David, you're going to make the, the trigger. And, uh, and Edward, you're going to make the, uh, the sights. And Frederick, you're going to assemble all the parts. And, and nobody's going to put their initials on because you all built it together. Well, they didn't like it at first, but they discovered a very strange thing, and that is that they were making more than twice as many revolvers every day than, the, than they used to. Interesting. So every man is getting double pay. Now, why would God care? Like God is saying to you, specialize, and I'll show you where in the Bible in a moment. God's saying specialize, and I'll reward you with the incredible blessing of financial abundance. Well, why would God care? And the reason is because in the old system, Matt, the old system that Sam used to work at, let's say that Charlie didn't show up for work one day. What's the reaction of uh, Adam and, and, and Brad and, and David and Edward and Frederick? They couldn't care less, right? Yeah, yeah. Just means there's more sandwiches and, bre and, and, sa and beer for them at lunchtime. Sure. <laughs> but in the second system... What happens when uh, Charlie doesn't show up for work one day? Production stops. Production doesn't even start. It's just not there. It stops, right? <laughs> so everybody runs over to Charlie's house and they say, hey, Charlie, what's the matter? Are you okay? And Charlie says, hey, you know, my kid's sick and I had to help my wife take care of the cows before I could leave for work. The guys say, well, quickly show us what to do. We'll help you. We want to get you back to the workshop as quickly as possible. And they help him and they get everything fixed up and they bring him back to the workshop and they get to work. In other words... We only care for one another because of specialization. Wow. If, if, if I could take care of all my needs, I wouldn't be in the slightest bit interested in the welfare of the Allen Edmonds Shoe Company because I make my own shoes. Who cares about anyone else? Sure. But since I, I live in my world of specialization, Allen Edmonds makes shoes that I can stand comfortably in when I give a lecture for two and a half hours. So I want them to stay in business. I, yep. I, I care about them. Yep. And so it is. Um, my wow. favorite restaurant, I want to make sure they do well. And the waiter who takes care, I want everybody to do well because otherwise they will not be able to continue serving me. So that's why it was that um, at the end of Genesis, Jacob is about to die and he calls his sons together. And uh, he spends 30 verses giving each of the sons a different kind of blessing. If it was me writing this book, I'd have had Jacob say, boys, you know what? You've all been a hell of a pain of a neck, pain in the neck for the last years. And you know what? God bless you all. I'm out of here. I'm going home to the Lord. Goodbye. I'm gone. <laughs> right. One verse. And instead of which we read, he gives a blessing to Reuben, he gives a blessing to Levi, he gives a blessing to Simon, gives a blessing to Judah, because he's setting them up for specialization. He's making them need one another. Wow. Each one is going to have a different specialty. And again, at the end of Deuteronomy, exactly the same thing. Uh, Moses on his deathbed, and uh, he calls all the tribes of Israel. And again, if it was me, I'd say, you know, man, the last 40 years through the desert has been sheer hell. I'm really, I'm, I, I've had it with you all up to here. You've all been a gigantic pain in the you know what. I'm out of here. God bless you all. Yep. And instead, again, it's another 30 verses. Every tribe gets its own blessing. Wow. 
Wow. To emphasize this idea that the best way to build connection is through specialization. Anybody, anyone who does their own taxes is making a big mistake. There are people who know how to do that better than you do. Use your time to do what you can do best and build a relationship with an accountant who'll take care of your taxes for you. That's what you need to do. Correct. And so that's the the secret that uh, we've been talking about. And you, you said that on the uh, 700 Club uh, interview, that you'll never find a Jewish man changing his own oil or mowing his own lawn, right? It's crazy, yeah. yeah. I mean, why would you do it when you can use your time productively? But But... In the communities I was raised in, African-American community, Latino community, Filipino community, they say, oh, but I'd save 20 bucks just doing it myself. Yeah. Which is a departure from... Right. I, I, if I did it myself, I'd save 20 bucks. And if instead I hired the kid down the street to do it for me for 20 bucks or 25 or 30 bucks, if I want to be lavish, uh, and then I use the time to finish drawing up the business plan I'm working on for a client. And when that finishes and I, I get paid $6,000, it, it was kind of a good deal not to take care of my own lawn. You know, since our last conversation, I've been really diving into this ancient wisdom, even started reading uh, the Talmud and, and uh, understanding the original um, meanings of the Hebrew words I, I've been studying. Uh, a, a couple words that I, I'd love to get your take on, a couple words I've extracted. Uh, because I've been wrestling with these words in the English translation because it causes many of my family and friends and people within inside the church to say, you know what, Matt, calm down, take it easy. You know, it's easier for a camel to go to the eye of a needle than a rich man going to heaven. You know, that's what Jesus said. He was a rabbi and all these different things. And, and, and people are seeing uh, uh, areas where they don't have to work, or for example, unemployment, where people are incentivized by the government not to go back to work. And we're all frustrated because now we want to go eat out at a diner and half the staff is there and half the dining room is filled and it's caused such a ripple effect. But there is this world called Ona'a, o o N A apostrophe A H Onaa. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Um, I think so. Yes. And what, what? Say that again. It's basically a, mean, a, a, a definition to mean uh, to discuss oppression. Yes. Yeah. Economic oppression, particularly. Economic oppression. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's exactly right. So, so, and the other word, because um, I've, I've been people trying to make me feel guilty that I'm ambitious. And I don't want to be content because people say, hey, Matt, God says for you just to be content. But I looked at the original context of which it was written in Hebrew, and the real world was salak. And, yeah. and, and, and from my understanding, it means to move forward. So can you, can you unpack those two? Yeah, questions? sure. So it actually doesn't say content because content is what cows are in a field on a sunny day. <laughs> Uh, people on, are not Rabbi meant, Bring we're it. not meant to be content. We're, we're meant to be constantly striving and struggling. To be content is basically to be dead, meaning you're, you're just accepting the situation as it is. But we don't accept the situation. Is if, we're, if we've got pimples on our face, we cure them. If we're introverted, we cure that. Uh, if you break a leg, you get a plaster cast and you get that fixed up. And, uh, and so it is. You, you don't accept a condition under any circumstances at all. We aim for totality. We aim for completion. And uh, just by the way, just because it may be hard to get harder to get to heaven as a, as a rich man, everything worthwhile is hard to do. And sure. so I wouldn't want to get to heaven easily. If, if being poor is an easy way to get to heaven, I understand. What it's saying is that poor people have very little choice. One of the reasons ancient Jewish wisdom compares poverty to death. Wow. Now, the difference is that, you know, you can come back from poverty. You can't come back from death. But, uh, but the similarity is you don't have choice. Interesting. You don't have After choice. we're dead, yep. uh, our souls no yep. longer have the ability to make choices. Our, the, the wonderful thing about a lifetime is all the choices you get to make. Many of them wonderful. Unfortunately, we all make mistakes. But um, uh, the, 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 the idea of seeking an easy life, that's not for godly people, not at all. And part of, be, of seeking a godly life is at embracing the challenges. And one of the challenges is, yes, of course, it's harder to get to heaven being rich. You know why? <laughs> As a rich guy, i got a lot of choices. I can do a <laughs> lot of things. <laughs> Uh, Rabbi, uh, ambition versus greed. Yeah. Ambition versus greed. Is there a difference? What yeah, a huge, a huge difference. A huge difference. Um, 
so first of all, we should also um, contrast greed and and envy. And envy is, is horrible. It's the worst of everything because it means that I'm envious of you. It's not that I want to get things you got. It's, I don't want you to have them. Uh, I want to get higher than you. I want to push you down. That's what envy is all about. Horrible thing. Yeah, very horrible. There was, there was a case of a... Um, uh, a woman in a woman's dorm a number of years ago who threw acid on the face of the girl who won a oh, beauty yeah. contest. That's that's envy. Huge. She doesn't want to go to a beauty salon. She wants to make sure the other girl isn't beautiful. That's envy. Um, and uh, uh, greed. Greed. The difference between greed and ambition is greed is it's all about me. Okay. It's all about me. And you know, somebody comes to me and says. Uh, I wonder if I can interest you in helping Jim. Jim's had a little bit of a setback. Uh, he's lost his business. He wasn't well. Can can you? We, we're trying to get together a few guys to put him back on his feet. Uh, and a greedy person says to himself, "I don't see how that's going to help me." And he says, "Oh, you know, I can't. I, I don't. I can't do anything. I'm sorry." Um, an ambitious person uh, is trying to add to the sum total of the society around him. So I'm trying to get more business. I'm trying to find more customers and more clients. Uh, but my motivation is to help them. Of course, I'm going to get paid. Of course, I'm going to make a profit. But it's not out of nowhere. It's in the context of helping other people. And what's more, at least 10% of what I make is going to go to gym or other gyms around there. Right. So no, there's a world of difference. But uh, amb our ambition should be limitless. Our greed should be zero. Oh, um, so with that being said, is there a what where is the line between ambition and greed? And how would you define and because, you know, you see Wall Street, you know, the movie greed is good. You know, go, oh, you know that's, go that's nonsense. Uh, yeah, yeah. OK. You no, know, there is no time that a, uh, a vice becomes a virtue unless unless you are going to distort 2000 years of Judeo Christian thinking. That's complete rubbish. Uh, okay. uh, no, greed is never good. But then uh, one of the uh, uh, habits of building a successful business and generating increased revenue um, is to start giving away 10% of your income. Now, there are a lot of reasons for that. Again, though, not that what I talk about here has nothing to do with, uh, uh, you know, God wants you to take care of the poor, nothing to do with that. Strictly from the point of view of generating revenue, being a giver is really good. Well, you, you answer the question yourself because part of being a giver is that you can never become a greedy person. You are always a giver as well. And so being a giver does a, many, many wonderful things for you. But one of the best is that it banishes the possibility of uh, becoming greedy. Interesting. I and love so it. trying to increase revenue... There's never a point at which that is greed. Okay. Okay. Because I'm not trying to increase revenue. I'm trying to find better ways to serve God's other children. That's right. That's right. Now, the, the added money follows after that, and, uh, and, and that's a wonderful and that's a good thing. But there's, there's no point at which somebody should say, uh, well, as soon as I'm making 100 grand, that's going to be enough for me. Because number one, you're lying. It won't. And number two, uh, it shouldn't be. And here is the one area where you and I might, I think this is literally maybe the only area we disagree. And that is that um, uh, retirement to me is a terrible thing. I agree with you on that one. No, uh, yeah, 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 I agree. I, and what here's, you're here, talking about is not retiring, but the ability to retire. Co correct. and Because I've seen the first five years of my career, Rabbi, was dealing with the retirement communities. And I saw what lifelessness, remote controls, doing nothing does versus yeah. somebody actively engaged in helping provide service. Yeah, you're exactly, you're exactly right. And, and, here's, and, and here's how uh, it looks at from a scriptural point of view, Matt. Um, you know, talking about accountants. Let's say I go to my accountant every year, April the 14th. Hey, here's all my shoebox full of papers. Uh, time to do taxes comes April the 14th a week ago and I go to him and uh, guess what he says oh I'm sorry I won't be helping you I said excuse me he says haven't you heard I've retired I said wait I don't understand why are you retired he said well I've made enough money I don't need anymore I'm off to play golf <laughs> I say the hell you are 
what about me? Don't you care about me? And his answer is, if I did, I wouldn't retire. Obviously, I don't care about you. Wow. And if you don't care about other people, why should God care about you? As a matter of fact, why should God even need you around? <laughs> That's why, unfortunately, God forbid, I hate this, but uh, people who retire deteriorate in health. Because basically, <laughs> I think God is saying to them, well, great, you've given up taking care of my other children, so goodbye. Who needs you? Yeah, Rabbi, when my, my father was laid off at 58 years old, and I just, so I simultaneously got out of the military, started my business. My dad simultaneously got laid off. Ah, terrible, and I, terrible and, thing. And I saw him for a period of years not be able to get a job. Terrible. And my mother's a nurse. I'm Filipino, right? So that means my mom's a nurse. So she's a nurse, you're a nurse, but she's effectively, you know, with, with the financial resource that that's able to provide. But I did see a deterioration in my dad's mind, his sharpness, yes, his wit, I, his engagement. Absolutely. It's tragic. Absolutely tragic. Yeah. Yes. Let me, let me explain something. Okay. If, uh, if United Airlines goes to, to, or Southwest Airlines buys Boeing airplanes, they go to Boeing and they put in an order for uh, 50 new 737s. And they say, by the way, what is your success rate? Like typically how many of your airplane, what percentage of your airplanes fly and stay flying? And Boeing says, yeah, you know, on a good day, we count on about 95% of our planes work. Right. They're, okay. They're ridiculous. Nobody would say that. Yeah, right, right. The answer is a hundred percent. They all do. I mean, yeah. you know, short of tragedy or pilot error, things happen. But planes, there's not ninety-eight percent of them fly. All of them fly. Yeah. Um, you know what? Bridge. You 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 go about to build a bridge. Bridge, huge, complex structure with cables and plating and ten. It's big. What percentage of bridges stand? Well, other than the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, which you'll hear about when you set up in Tacoma, um, which was an unusual case in 1941, I think. They shut it off, right? They, they, they shut that off? Or... It, yeah. it, it, fell, it, it fell, but uh, yeah. <laughs> other than that, 100% uh, of bridges stand. Right, correct. You know, uh, other than the Titanic, what percentage of ships that are built float? Yeah. All of them. Yeah. All of them. What percentage of marriages work? Ooh, Hundred percent? Correct. No, of course not. Not, not even close. Yeah. How about business startups? How what percentage of them? Yeah, 90, 95 percent fail rate in the first three years. Fail rate is very, very high. In fact, the marriage rate and the business success rate is kind of about the same. So why is it? it? Everyone thinks they know how to be married. Everyone thinks they know how to start a business, but the success rate is maybe sixty percent. And yet uh, nobody thinks they're now to build a bridge or build a plane, and yet the success rate is 100%. Mm -hmm. um, it's, um, it's, it's really important to understand that on physical matters, it's, physical matters are really easy. Mm -hmm. Things yeah. that are measurable in a lab or in an engineering workshop, very, very easy to do. Um, mm -hmm. And... And, you know, and again, I mean, uh, you, you, you got a, a gun and you want to work out the trajectory. Uh, what is the angle of elevation if you want it, if you want the, the shell or the, um, yeah. uh, you're, you're, you're round, you're round, round on target. You want it to, to land in a certain place. This is not hard to do. Correct. Not hard to do because when you're dealing with physical characteristics, uh, these things are all very easy. But as soon as you are dealing with what I call spiritual characteristics, and Matt, can I take 30 seconds here to talk about definition? Because it's really important. Please, please, please. That please. Everybody gets clear yeah. definitions here. Um, spiritual has nothing to do with me being a rabbi. Spiritual has nothing to do with God. Spiritual has nothing to do with religion. Spiritual has nothing to do with piety or virtue or sin. Uh, spiritual just means something I cannot measure in a laboratory. And so I, I can measure uh, the skin color of a person. I can measure the height of a person. I can measure the weight of the person. And the truth is that every one of those things are irrelevant. If I'm hiring somebody, <laughs> I really don't care about any of those things. The things I care about are integrity, optimism, willpower, yep. resilience. Yep. Those things are not measurable. So, R Rabbi, this blows my mind away because I talk to a lot of men and we encourage them to get in business for themselves. And next thing you know, to build a business, 
you gotta get that. You gotta go out there and know people. You gotta increase those that know you and trust you. And next thing you know, a lot of men, they say, you know what? I'd just rather work with my hands. You know? Because I, now I get it. Because it's so easy to deal with wrenches and it's engines. It's, it's, it's easy. Look, uh, whether, whether, whether you're a, uh, an auto mechanic or whether you are a surgeon, uh, it's just, uh, you, you're just working with different tools and, you know, the stakes are a little bit higher with the surgery, but it's basically, <laughs> it's basically all physical. Yeah. It, you're taking tools and you're fixing some pipes or tubes that don't work the way they ought to, the hydraulic system or the, uh, the blood, or whatever it is, that's all physical. But why is it that there are some auto mechanics or plumbers who make a fortune and others barely make a living? There are surgeons, believe it or not, there are surgeons who struggle, who are not making a lot of money, and there are others who are making a huge amount of money. And the answer is that uh, the ones who are succeeding, whether they are surgeons or mechanics, are the ones who understand the spiritual qualities as well. Uh, they learn how to market. They learn how to sell. Yes, it's true. If, if you want to work with your hands, that's great. Be a mechanic, but build up the business. Hire more people to work for you. Develop the marketing. Make, make, make sure there's always a line of people trying to get you to take care of their cars. Now, that part is the spiritual part. Wow, that is profound. That, because that requires then, which one of your habits talks about increasing your self-discipline, integrity, and character strength in achieving success, which is habit or secret number 11. Yeah, exactly right. There so, you go. Can, can I ask you then, um, then this? Money's so spiritual then. Does, 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 if money's so spiritual, does, does, God, yeah. would God, does God really want us to be rich? No. If okay. he does, if he does, he hasn't shared that information with me. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's a little bit like, um, does God want us to have great sex? Um, I think so, because he... I'll save you. I'll save you. <laughs> um, again, unfortunately, the Lord has not shared that with me. <laughs> I live in hope. But um, what I do know is that the Lord does want... Um, one man and one woman to be utterly devoted to one another until they become like a unified entity. And it shouldn't surprise us that a good and, and loving God should reward that behavior with the greatest sensual pleasure known to human beings, which is sex. Correct. Does he want us to be rich? Unfortunately, he hasn't shared that with me, although I live in hope. But I do know that above all, he wants us to be obsessively preoccupied with taking care of one, an one another's needs and desires. And it should not... Now, if you want to be cynical, you can call that market research, you can call it marketing, you can call it selling. But if you are obsessively preoccupied with taking care of other people's needs, why would it surprise you that a good and loving God would reward you with the incredible blessing of financial abundance? Wow. Wow. Uh, and that's why the way, by the way, that we Jews never pray to God. Oh, please, God, help me find $600 that I can make the rent payment next week. Okay. We never say that. Okay. We always say, please, God, open my eyes so that I can see more of your children that need my services. The money will follow by itself. Amen. Look at that. Uh, we've got a rapper here in America called Jay-Z. Okay. Yes. He took heat for his comments in his song, Story of O.J., uh, and his comments on Jewish people in his song, o Story of O.J., and then the lyrics go like this. You want to know what's more important than throwing away money at a strip club? Credit. You ever wonder why Jewish people own all the property in America? This is how they did it. Okay? And so a lot of people thought that was anti-Semitic term, but he's actually giving a shout-out to... I like it. I, I'm not community. bothered by it at all. Okay. So, so... Uh, your friends. I wish, with... it was, I wish it was true. <laughs> Correct. Oh, okay. So, so you're, you're obviously you're, you're friends with uh, Dave Ramsey, and and he's he's very anti credit card, anti credit anything. Yes. Yes. But how has the Jewish people leverage that with being money lenders? Yeah. And, and um, yeah, right. 
it's an important question. And uh, look, I'm a huge fan of, of Dave Ramsey. He has brought financial peace to, to more Americans than anybody else. And I mean, I think you may be creeping up on his Come numbers. Come on, baby, let's go seven figure squad. Yes, sir. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, and th the problem is that uh, for many of us, um, debt is becomes an addiction. And the problem is that once, you know, once you owe, you know, a few thousand dollars, it never seems like a big deal to add another few hundred dollars. And that's why debt tends to spiral out of control. And Dave Ramsey has developed a system for helping you and me, ordinary America, ordinary people everywhere around the world, uh, to break that pattern and to get out of debt. And it's an absolute lifesaver. Um, having done that, once you're out of debt and you're able to, um, uh, to enjoy the freedom that being debt-free imparts, to then say, okay, um, you know, my business is running at this, at this level, this is what I've got, uh, I'm going to borrow a, a quarter of a million dollars to stock up and boost my inventory for the holiday season because I know I'm going to run out of uh, run out of product, and and so I'm now going to go into debt, you know, to the tune of 250 grand, um, which I should be in a position to pay back by uh, the end of January. It, it would be silly not to, as long as you're not in a fragile situation. So is that if something goes wrong, and let's say the customers don't materialize for some reason, you're not ruined. Right. Then right. You, if, if you're running that close to the wind, then you you mustn't. You're not ready for debt yet, right. and the debt must never be consumer debt. It must never be, um, you know, gee, I really want to buy Christmas presents for everybody, so I'm going to borrow. No, no, not for that. But to go into debt to buy a piece of real estate, God bless you, go for it. Yes. Um, you know, be wise. Money is made in real estate on the buying end, not the selling end. If you buy stupidly, you'll never make money on the selling end. What a profound perspective. Yeah, by the way, a lot of people would argue it's the other way. Interesting that you said that because you're investing for cash, you're for cash flow. I get it. We're in the holiday season. And uh, I, I'm just curious, uh, what, what happens in a Jewish family? If I'm a child right now, and I'm being raised by you, Rabbi Lappin, and, and I, you know, everybody's about gifts and buying things and, and exchanges and shopping. What's going on in a Jewish household? What is a Jewish household during, doing during this time of the year? What well, does that mean? Interestingly enough, um, Hanukkah is at this roughly the same time of the year as Christmas is. And um, what we do is we give children, Hanukkah, we start educating children about money. And so the gift we, I, we like to give children on Hanukkah is money. And uh, we also accompany that with discussions of, of what money is and what it's about and what you have to. And now you have to, you know, divide your money into three. Uh, you know, one part is for charity. One part is for you to spend on things you need. The other part is to put away and save. Um, so, yeah, Hanukkah is, uh, is the money time of the year for us. It's it's passing on to the next generation the principles of money that are so important. And, and educate me too as well. Uh, uh, our, our guy that runs our Orlando office, he's, he's Jewish and uh, he used to uh, host bar mitzvahs. I mean, he, was, he and his brother, bar mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs, they used to throw parties all the time. In, in the Filipino and in the Latino community, it's called quinceanera or debut when a girl comes of age. Or a, 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 and then there's, I guess, there's really no ritual for a, a young man in those, in those um, uh, ethnic groups. But what happens at, what's the conversation at, at a bar mitzvah? I, I'm just, I've been part of some, but I don't, I don't know because I'm just having a good time. What's happening? How much money is being spent for a bar mitzvah? And is the 15, 16 year old son or daughter receiving some form of, I guess, cash capital as a gift? What is that like? Uh, Matt, I'm sorry to have to tell you. Please educate that, me. Uh, about 50 or 60%, maybe a bit more, of self described uh, American Jews um, know as much about Judaism as they know about neurosurgery. <laughs> um, and so. Unfortunately, uh, for that part of American Jewry, uh, the bar mitzvah has deteriorated 
into a, an excuse for a wild party. Okay. And they spend a lot of money. And it's um, uh, Jews who are uh, closer, who are who take God's word seriously. Uh, a bar mitzvah is not a party at all. It's a time where you hand off responsibility to a young man at the age of 13. Oh. And you tell him that uh, up till now, you've been a kid from now on, you have to uh, fulfill God's wishes. You could ignore them and play when you were a kid. Now you can't. And so there's no, no money needs to be spent at all. It's not, it's not party time. It's serious time. Wow. It's, it's more like, um, you know, many cultures, if I'm not mistaken, I, I think maybe some uh, American Indian cultures used to have a ritual to, uh, to help young men become sure. braves coming of age yeah right right correct and now we don't do that for girls you know why because little girls automatically become young ladies by nature taking yeah they, they just do yeah but little boys if you don't do something to give them a kick in the pants spiritually speaking of course they um uh, they will become 40-year-old adolescents. Wow. Um, little boys will stay little boys for as long as they possibly can. Yeah, without, without being forced to grow up. I, yeah, I mean, was, and was, so the bar mitzvah yeah. is a spiritual kick in the pants. It's, you know what, we've given you a free ride up till here. Now you're, now you're one of the guys you have to carry the load. Wow. So how does one, so Rabbi Lapin, to make sure we get this right, because I see this as a major area of financial curses that happen in people's life when they choose the wrong partner, they yeah, choose the wrong yeah. wife. Yeah. How do we go about choosing the right life partner, wife, mother, your child, father, your child? Fantastic, fantastic point. And I, I love talking about this on my podcast quite often. Um, because it keeps on, on coming up, but this is something that I, I, I I, even though it's challenging to answer in in just uh, one instance, because again, there's there's uh, layers upon layers, but I, it's important enough that we should we should address it for our audience. And um, it, this isn't going to be easy to hear. Okay. But um, and I certainly I specifically address this to young women, but I also address it to young men. Uh, I did a show about the 10 most important years in a man's life. And I know you'll relate to this because of your, um, your, your uh, um, frightening self-honesty and self-awareness. <laughs> um, but the most important 10 years in a man's life are from the age of 13 to 23. Wow. Because if you, if you get them all right, then everything after that will be fine. Unbelievable. Um, so, uh, and again, obviously, the most, the most common letter I get from people again and again is, you know, thank you for that teaching of ancient Jewish wisdom. Where were you when I was 20? Correct. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, I totally understand that. You, yes, we make mistakes. And um, choosing the wrong spouse is right up there. Now, <laughs> uh, it's not unrecoverable. Let's say you chose the wrong spouse. It's, it's, it's a battle, but you can still get it right. It's much easier to choose the right one to begin with. How do you do it? Okay. Uh, number one, um, you try and remove love from your vocabulary. Wow. The heart. Now, that doesn't mean I lack sentiment. It doesn't, sure. mean, I, it doesn't mean I don't love my woman. Um, I, I don't, it, that's not what it means. But right, what it right, does right. mean is that nine times out of 10, when you say love, you actually mean lust, if you're honest about it. Oh, of course, yeah, it's a sex, yeah. And, and so when, you know, when I say I love roast turkey, <laughs> I mean, if that were true, if I really loved the turkey, I wouldn't eat it, I'd set it free. <laughs> when I say I love turkey, I'm saying I love how turkey makes me feel. Correct, yes. And most times when a guy says, I love you, he is talking about what getting in her pants would make him feel. Sure. That's all. Sure. So um, that's, that's an important thing. So number two, addressing myself to young women, if you marry a guy because he says he loves you, then you must fully now know 
that you are morally obliged to accept when he tells you he doesn't love you anymore, but he loves a girl he met at his office. If you marry because he loved you, then you have to end the marriage when he doesn't love you. It's just fair. I mean, that's the only fair way to go. And so, um, uh, how do how do we how do we deal with all this? Well, my advice, and again, hard to follow, but I I give it for what it's worth. It's worth a huge amount, and to the extent that you can follow it, I strongly recommend that a couple talks on the phone for at least four hours before they meet one another. That's right. Which means that you do not Touch. plan on marrying somebody you met in a bar. <laughs> Right. Um, you, you, ask, you ask people who know you and people who you trust to set you up with someone they know. You ask relatives, you ask friends. You be, if you're a single person, make sure that most of your friends are not single. Make sure you're friends with ma happily married couples. Ideally, couples who are in a marriage you would like to emulate. Ask them to introduce you to somebody and tell them you want to talk to that person on the phone before you meet them. Mm. And talk extensively so you can get to know the person before the old hormones kick in. But the problem we have today, Rabbi, is Instagram and Facebook and social media, the visual. It's a big problem because it's all visual. Yeah. It's a big problem. And then finally, and most importantly, um, you, uh, you don't date open-endedly. Uh, you date purposefully, specifically for the purpose of finding out marriage compatibility. And marriage then is, if it's not love, what is it? The answer is, it's a commitment. That's what it is. And commitments don't change. And is that the reason why the stereotype is that married couples do better because there's a natural commitment that goes on uh, versus yeah. people that are single that are in business because there's really no commitment and how you do one thing is how you do everything? Uh, and that's why it is that people who marry, this is a well-known figure, people who marry after living together get divorced much more than people who don't. Wow. Yeah, it's exactly as you say, it's the commitment thing. So commitment is huge, which, which means that the integrity of the person you marry is hugely important. I'm not saying looks don't count. Correct. They do, but Correct. other things also count. And today, nobody pays attention to the other things. So it doesn't make sense to be married to somebody for three months before you discover they have no integrity. It's kind of something you should have known before. Going into 2022, getting past this pandemic, getting past these things that yes. economically yeah. hurt a lot of people. What would your guidance be going to the next year? Um, well, I think uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that people should um, get hold of my book, Thou Shall Prosper. Of course. Um, yeah. Obviously, people should uh, connect with somebody like you as a specific guide. But in, in more general terms, I'd say, number one, if you haven't yet learned how to read financial statements, use the rest of this year to take an online course or buy, borrow books from the library, whatever you want. It's just not that hard to do. But the bottom line is you cannot change anything you cannot measure. You cannot change anything you cannot measure. If you want to lose weight, for example, and you don't have a scale, it's not going to happen. Right. You've got to be able right. to. So, uh, although you might say to yourself, and you know, I haven't got that much money right now. I, I really don't need a profit and loss report. I really don't need cash flow state. Yes, you do. Because you now need to set up the system that will operate when you are have reached the point you want to reach. Okay. So uh, please learn to uh, learn to work fluently with financial statements. Uh, number two, spend less time in front of a screen with entertainment and more time with books. You don't say you have the whole library behind you. I agree. Don't yeah. corrupt your brain with nonsense. Yeah, yeah but this, this is just a virtual background, you know. This is just yeah. a uh, <laughs> screen, but it's a very sophisticated one because it lets me do things like this, you know. Hey, not bad. It's like three. You have the 3D back screen. It's a very sophisticated virtual screen. Yes, that's right. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so 
there are several reasons for that. Reading books improves your ability to communicate. Watching television or YouTube does not. Uh, secondly, uh, it develops your cognitive ability. You, 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 you are smarter when you read than when you watch. Watch is a passive activity which reduces your ambition and it reduces your testosterone. It's just bad. So use, make a resolution to use a certain number of hours, take away from screen time and add it to book time. I, and I, I've, uh, I've and never then heard lost. of the difference there. I've never heard oh, somebody break down the difference between watching and reading. Huge, huge difference, Matt, huge. Yeah. Um, guys' testosterone goes down and their estrogen goes up the more time they sit on a couch watching the screen. Boom, there it is. Hello, everybody. Hey, guys, put down the cheeseburger, pick up a book, and pick up some dumbbells. <laughs> Yeah, that way you you make sure you don't become a dumbbell. I mean, is God, is, 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 in your understanding, is God somebody that will never want to see the poor? Because it, when I read the Bible and I see all these different things, why is there such large income inequality today? Uh, or, or, or the illusion of it? Yeah, um, so uh, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 15 has two verses um, uh, only a few verses apart. One of them says that um, uh, you must always give the poor because um, uh, they'll always be around. Okay. Wow. And the other one in the in chapter fifteen of Deuteronomy says uh, basically that if you follow the edicts of uh, of of the Lord, there will be no poor among you. Well, you can't have it both ways. <laughs> Either there'll be no poor, or there'll always be poor. But make up your mind. Okay. And ancient Jewish wisdom explains these two verses in Deuteronomy 15 um, very simply, saying, look, uh, if you, if you um, follow these systems and principles and these timeless truths, you will never be poor. You've got nothing to worry about. But always know that if you look over one shoulder, you'll see people with more than you. And if you look over the other shoulder, you'll see people with less than you. That's a reality. Because God created people very differently from animals. And that is the, uh, the whole lesson of Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, which is that people and animals are completely different. The fact is that um, if a zookeeper um, is, you know, time to feed the elephants, he, he gives every elephant of the same size the same amount of food because equality works with animals. <laughs> uh, farmers feeding the cows, all the cows get the same amount of food roughly. Sure. But you can't do that with people. Why is that? Because God decided to give us something more important than equality, and that's freedom. And when you have freedom, you have freedom to excel, and you have freedom to goof off and do nothing. Wow. And the only deal God made with us is it's your life. You can do what you like. The only thing you have to know is you have to live with the consequences. I'm hmm. not going to bail you out. <laughs> there it is. And so, um, uh, you know, I know this is sort of politically incorrect because it sort of sounds as if I'm blaming the victim. But uh, today, uh, poverty is not um, the result of anything external that anybody is doing to anybody else. It's a result of bad habits, bad behavior, and bad culture. That's all. So when they pour $4 trillion into the economy, uh, when 40% of all wealth, 40% uh, of all money is printed in the United States of America was created in the last 12 months because of COVID, and they're pouring all this money to help lift up the bottom. Your thoughts on it? Yeah, not going to do it. It's not going to do it. Going to do it. Uh, you want to, you know, you take a, a poor guy, a guy who's got no money. You want to, you want to help him. I would say to him, "Don't take my money. That's not going to help you. Take my values." Ooh. Okay. I can. And I'll tell you what to do. Um, first of all, you've got to learn the, the soft skills. You've got to be able to be subservient. You've got to stop making your machoism uh, your most important characteristic. You've got to be able to learn how to serve a boss, an employer, or a customer. 
And that's not easy. It goes against everything you've been acculturated with since you were a child. And then you're going to have to learn a skill. Then you're going to have to learn to show up, not at eight o'clock on Monday morning, but at 10 minutes to eight Monday morning. And you're going to stay not till five o'clock, but till 10 past five. And you're going to do more than is expected of you. And number two, do not have children before you're married. Number three, make sure you learn how to talk. Speak whatever language, whatever country you're in, speak that language. Do not speak a bastardized version of it. Huh. Because otherwise you can't communicate effectively. You turn people off. All you got to do is these things, and I promise you, you're on the financial escalator. Now, it's not, they're not going to be easy, but that's all that's going to put you on the financial escalator. And it's not the immediate result that people are looking for today. That's correct, yes. I'm afraid, afraid. I, mean, I mean, you want an immediate result, there's probably nothing quicker than robbing a convenience store. That's right. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.